I don't know what that was. I'm not sure <laughs> who's responsible for that, but uh, it's going to be a great time. Winter Village, if you want to serve, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. See Laura Garcelle. We'd be happy to put you to work. It's going to be a great event. In the meantime, uh, let's refocus our attention here on the book of uh, Exodus. I don't, there's no easy transition for that. I don't know. But we're going through the book of Exodus together. Um, and uh, today, the children of Israel are uh, moving from the, the wilderness uh, to the mountain. And so uh, take a look with me at chapter 19, verse 1, uh, which records uh, these words. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. Uh, remember that getting to Sinai has been the goal the whole time. God said, let my people go that they may worship me. When God called Moses on this mountain with the burning bush, he said, you will return to me and you will worship me on this very mountain. Here he has come back to where it all started. Moses has come back full circle. Now, Mount Sinai is a significant event in the Pentateuch. Just take a look at this chart just to see the amount of time that's dedicated in the first five books of the Bible to their experience at Mount Sinai. You can see that from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Exodus chapter 18, those 68 chapters cover 2,600 years. And then Israel will spend just the next 11 months at Sinai, yet that is covered in the next 57 chapters of the Bible as they will be at Mount Sinai from Exodus 19 all the way through Leviticus all the way to Numbers chapter uh, 10. And so you can see that what happens at Sinai is very important to understanding the Pentateuch, the Torah, the law of Moses. Exodus is the story of God's people leaving Egypt, the land of slavery. That largely takes up the first half of the book of Exodus. But friends, that is not where the story ends. Unlike Hollywood and many depictions of the book of Exodus that kind of end at the Red Sea, uh, the book of Exodus continues to its climax here because Exodus is not just about God pulling his people out. It is also about God pulling his people in. God brings them out to bring them toward himself. Exodus is about God saving a people and then setting apart a people unto himself. He delivers his people and then he dwells with his people. He redeems his people and then he brings his people into his very presence. And friends, he does the same for us. Their story is our story. God draws us out to draw us near. God draws us out to draw us near. Let me put that on the screen for you. God draws us out to draw us near. This is a journey that we take from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from, from slavery to glory. Amen. And this is a journey that you and I are on as well. And so today we come to the big 10. Today we come to God's perfect 10 commandments, God's perfect law. And by way of introduction, I don't think I'm overstating this when I say that there is no document that's ever been written ever created in human history that has changed the world for the better quite like the Ten Commandments. Uh, you can make the argument that Western civilization, the civilization that developed universal human rights, created women's equality, ended slavery, would not have developed without the foundation of the Ten Commandments. You will see today that these commandments are just as relevant in our day as they were when they were written 3,500 years ago. In fact, one could say that keeping the Ten Commandments are all that is necessary to create a good world, a free world, a world that is free of tyranny and cruelty. Just imagine a world where it was completely free of all lying, all theft, and all murder. In that world, there would be no need for any armies or any police or any security or anything any court of law. Men, women, and children could walk anywhere, any time of day or night without fear of ever being robbed or killed. Imagine a world in which all children honored their parents, all husbands and all wives always honored their marriage covenant, and no one ever coveted their neighbor's belongings. That's an amazing world to consider. That's the world being talked about here in the Ten Commandments. Now, right away, the average person reads the Ten Commandments or they read the Law of Moses, and there's a problem that they have with that. Two popular 
uh, really misunderstandings. First, one person might say, oh, okay, uh, so this is what I need to do to please God. This is what I need to do to become righteous. This is what I have to do to be holy. This is how I, I earn my salvation. This is how I get to heaven, like a stairway to heaven. That's not what this is. Or other people, they read the law and they say, well, come on, Dave, surely at this stage in human existence, we cannot be still believing in a God of law. We believe in a God of love, but don't you know that the law is the expression of God's love? Don't you know that Jesus said, if you really love me, you will keep my commandments? See, both of those misunderstandings are simplistic. Both of those are dangerously naive. Both of them really miss the entire point of the Pentateuch. The Bible describes the relationship that we have as human beings with the law as much more nuanced than that, much more complicated than that, and much more multifaceted than that, and thankfully much more hopeful than that. And so as we go through these uh, chapters today in the book of Exodus, I want you to see three things. I want you to see the purpose of the law and also the explanation of the law And then lastly, I want you to see the problem with the law, the purpose of the law, the explanation of the law, and the problem with the law. So that's where we're headed today. Why don't we pray and ask for the Lord's blessing on our time in His Word. Would you pray with me? God, it's just amazing to think that what we're about to read here is your your perfect Word written by your finger uh, for your people. Help us to know what you desire from us. Teach us to know what it means to follow you. And most of all, Lord, would you show us your heart? Uh, We say with with the prophet Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a little context, Exodus 19 through 24 is commonly called the Book of the Covenant or the, the Sinai Covenant. This section of the Bible is a covenant that God made with his people Israel And chapter 19, you might think of it as the preamble to the Constitution. Chapter 19 is kind of a prologue to the covenant, and it it continues like this in verse 3. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, pause right there and just notice where God begins. God says to Moses, remind the people what I did for them and what I did to Egypt. Remind them of how I humiliated Pharaoh and all of the Egyptian gods one by one by one. Remind them how I drowned the entire army in the Red Sea. Remind them of my miraculous deliverance for them and my provision for my people, even in the wilderness. They were eyewitnesses to these things. I carried them on eagles' wings to the point that they are now. Now, looking at this text, let's see if we can answer that question. What was the purpose of the law? Why was this law given? That's an important question because Paul tells his protege Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, the law is good if you use it properly. What does that mean? What what is the proper use of God's law? What's the inappropriate use of God's law? Now, as I mentioned earlier, some people think about God's law as a way to earn God's salvation or earn favor or earn my status and and enter into the family of God. But take a look at this text. Look at verse 3, if you will, and ask yourself that question. Were the Israelites saved out of Egypt because of their obedience to God's law? Or were they saved first and then God called them to obedience? It's the latter, isn't it? God does not say, if you obey my law, then I'll deliver you from Egypt. He says, no, rather, I'm going to carry you out of Egypt myself. This is my doing, and then I'm going to give you my perfect law. You yourselves have seen what I did. And so before God asks them to do anything, anything at all, he reminds them of what he had first done for us. And it is the same way in the New Testament. We love because he first loved us. You have seen what I did. You yourselves have seen what I did, he says. Now think about that question in your own personal life. What have you seen God do for you? And how does that stir up in your hearts a sense of gratitude and obedience for God's law? We see that the law was not given to earn salvation. Well, why was it given? There are three answers generally to that question that theologians give. The first one's on the screen already. The law was given to restrain human evil. 
Romans chapter 13 speaks about how governments enforce the law and strike fear into the hearts of those who do wrong. There's a general understanding in the human conscience when we do wrong that there are consequences uh, that must be paid. God has built that into us. Uh, it, are, it is our fear of judgment. That's one of the reasons the law exists. Uh, Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, uh, we also know that the law, I'll put this on the screen for you, we also know that the law was not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. The law re re uh, re uh, restrains human evil. Now, right away, those words on the screen, very countercultural, very controversial in our day, I know. Our society and our culture has a very different view of human nature and humankind uh, than the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview would say that humankind is very capable of sin, very capable of evil. Our heart is bent in on itself, especially when we're given positions of great freedom and great power. We tend to abuse those positions of freedom and power. And so the law comes in with an immense kind of realism about it. And that's why in our society, which is built on top of the Judeo-Christian ethic, we built into our society checks and balances in order to understand that, you know, there has to be a separation of powers to protect ourselves against ourselves because of humanity's propensity towards sin and evil. That's why the law was given, to restrain human evil. A second reason why the law is given is to reveal to us God's character. The law is going to teach us about the beauty, the perfection, the goodness, the righteousness, the sweetness, and the holiness of God. Exodus chapter 19 continues by saying this in verse 5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. Now pause there and notice he describes them as a holy nation. The word means to be set apart or to be sanctified, to be distinct, to be different, to be peculiar. If you need to fit in in life, then this is going to be an uncomfortable passage for you. Israel was not defined by fitting in with the other nations. They were to stand out and be set apart and be holy. And Israel was holy because God had made them holy. They were a set-apart nation, not because of their political strength or great power, but because of their allegiance to the one true God and His law. Amen. Now think about this next phrase. He says, you'll be a kingdom of priests. What would a priest do? What's the job of a priest? Well, a priest was to be a mediator. A priest was to be a representative of the people to God, to usher people into the presence of God. And we're going to see here in this text that Moses is going to go up the mountain to receive the revelation from God, and then he's going to go down the mountain to deliver that revelation to the people. In verse 3, Moses goes up the mountain. In verse 7, he goes down the mountain. This is an 8,000-foot mountain. Then in verse 8, he goes up the mountain. And then in verse 14, he goes down the mountain. And then in verse 20, he goes up the mountain. And then in verse 25, he goes down the mountain. Altogether, in the next few chapters, Moses takes seven different trips up and down, up and down, up and down this mountain as God's mediator. He's a go-between. He mediates between the people and God. That's his job, to give the people the message from God. In that sense, God says Israel's job as an entire people is to be a mediator. They're to be a go-between. They're to be a, a messenger for the rest of all of the nations as well. Israel as an entire people group is going to be a kingdom of priests who mediate God's message, God's word, God's law to all of the other nations around them. That's why the scripture says the whole earth is mine or all of the world belongs to God. Israel was a display people a light in the darkness, a showcase for the world uh, to show others what it means to be in covenant relationship with God, our creator and redeemer, and how God changes us as a people. Israel was not only chosen from the nations, they were chosen for the nations. Everything Israel was to do in the past and everything we are to do in the present is also because God has all peoples, the whole world in view. It all belongs to him. And then notice he also says that you will be my treasured possession. You will be my treasured 
possession. They would reflect him in a special way. Now, I want you to mark that phrase down because I'm going to come back to it later. There is a third use of the law that I would like to share with you, but first we have to get through some of these other texts before we get to that third use. For now, let's continue. After Moses tells the people to be prepared, to be consecrated, to practice abstinence for a few days, to get ready for God to descend, something amazing happens in verse 16. Drop down there with me if you would. It says, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Wow. Wow. This is quite a scene. Can you imagine this awesome display of God's power and majesty and dominion? The presence of God. The writer of Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire. God descends in a special way, and then God speaks. Chapter 20 continues with these words, and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This is God revealing himself to his people. This is who I am. Now, God is about to give them 10 words, 10 commandments. But I want you to notice right here before I even look at number one, that they are built on this premise right here. The premise is that this law was given by an authority that is not the authority of any man. It is a higher authority than any king or any human government. Notice the very first line. It says, God spoke all these words. These commandments are not laws given by Moses. These are the laws that are given by God Almighty himself. Friends, if these commandments are not given by God, then they're not authoritative. They are not enforceable universally, as without God, all values and morality become relative to each person, and all matters of right and wrong become just matters of personal preference. But the Ten Commandments do not claim to be the opinions of a mere man or woman. Rather, they claim to be indeed the very values of our one true God. Friends, when the sailors used to sail the seas long before GPS technology, they would use the North Star. It was a star that wouldn't move in the sky, and they knew that's a fixed point, and if I'm here and I know that's there, then I can know to get from where I want to go to where I need to go. Friends, you need a north star in your life. Everyone has a source of authority in your life. You might be your own source of authority. Everyone has an authority. If you don't have an authority in your life, you're going to listen to all kinds of different conflicting opinions. One day, this psychologist is going to say this, The next generation, another psychologist is going to say that. One day you'll decide this, another day you'll decide that, and then one day you won't be able to decide at all. But if you decide that God's word is going to be the authority in your life, that's going to simplify your decision making. Friends, our God is not a silent God. He is a God who speaks. He is a God who has a voice and thunders from Mount Sinai. And that same God that spoke back then speaks to us today. After all, Hebrews chapter 12 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. God is speaking. The question is, am I listening? And so we start to see the purpose of the law. And now we need to go a little bit more in depth about the explanation of the law. As we look at these commandments, I would I recognize that this could easily become a 10-week series, and I don't have time to go in depth on every one like I would like to. I will offer a brief explanation of each one, but I would also encourage you to dive deeper into each of these commandments yourself on your own. If you want to do that, the Westminster Confession has a very helpful section on each of these commandments and all the implications for all of our lives. It's an excellent resource. It's at the bottom of your sermon notes for today. Check that out. But for now, let's briefly walk them through. Commandment number one. God says this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before my face, literally. Now, let me just say one other thing about the structure here. You will notice that commandments one, two, three, and four have to do with my responsibility, my accountability to God. And then commandments number five through 10 have to do with my responsibilities to other people. And so one through four is about how I love God. And then five through 10 is about how I love others. 
Commandment number one is foundational. The reformer Martin Luther saw this first commandment as the commandment upon which all of the rest of the commandments were based. Uh, The temptation towards worshiping other gods is my fundamental problem as a human being. Uh, In other words, if, if you're having a problem in your life, any kind of problem, it's because you've allowed something else besides the one true God to become the center of your life. For example, let's say you're always too busy and you never take a Sabbath and you keep overbooking your schedule. Now, one of the ways you could try to handle that is you could try to get some new software on your computer. You could try to manage your calendar better. Maybe you could hire an executive assistant to help you, you know, schedule out your time in a more efficient way. Or you could try to get underneath of that problem and recognize that the reason why you keep on overbooking yourself is because you can't say no to other people. And the reason is because other people and their approval of you has become an idol in your life. Every sin has underneath of it the violation of the first commandment. And so it's foundational for us to understand no other gods before my face. Commandment number two. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, most people, when they think about this commandment, understandably think it only has to deal with the worship of other statues or false gods like Baal or Molech or Zeus or Jupiter. But it's so much more than that. This is about even the worship of images related to the one true God. Because doing that, by definition, reduces the majesty of God to something finite something that I can understand. That is to reduce God to something of my own making, to make God more controllable or to make God more manageable. But friends, God cannot be boxed in. The infinite cannot be contained in the finite. And so God says, don't even try. Psalm 115 says, don't make idols out of wood and stone. It's a stick. It's a rock. Don't devalue who I am by trying to form some image of me Like that. Don't make any graven images. We're going to see that later on in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, the golden calf incident. They say, this is a festival to Yahweh. They've they've made a graven image out of the one true God. It's very displeasing to God. Don't make graven images. Commandment number three. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, is this about using the name of God or using the name of Jesus like a curse word or an inappropriate manner? I think there's some value in thinking of it that way. Uh, The name of Jesus Christ should not be what comes out of your mouth when you hit your thumb with a hammer. Have you ever heard any other God being referred to as a curse word like that? Does anybody hit their thumb with a hammer and go, oh, Muhammad? Oh, Allah. I, I don't hear that. I only hear the name of the one true God coming out as a curse word. And so we have to be a more reverent culture, I think. After all, Jesus, when he taught us to pray, said, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, I think more than that, this commandment also would prohibit the idea of me committing sin or doing evil and using God's name to justify that behavior. You might remember there's a story, an obscure story in the Old Testament with King Saul. He goes to visit a witch. And when he's visiting this witch, King Saul invokes the name of the Lord in terms of a blessing upon her. And he says this, quote, as the Lord lives, trying to protect her, as the Lord lives, no harm will come to you, unquote. That's blasphemous, and Saul is judged for that behavior. And so this commandment is about me using God's name or twisting God's word to justify my own agenda. This is the person who selectively cites one Bible verse to justify something while ignoring all the other inconvenient parts of the Bible that address that exact behavior. And doing that makes you a Bible abuser. The third commandment is about a prohibition about using the name of the Lord in vain in that way. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall 
labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Now, not many people think that the fourth commandment is particularly important or relevant in their lives, much less binding in their lives. But once you appreciate it, I think you'll see the benefit. First of all, this commandment would elevate the dignity of every single human being. Remember in Egypt, the Israelites worked nonstop as slaves. Slaves cannot have a Sabbath. A slave owner was under no obligation to allow the slave to rest. But in Exodus, God has set his people free. And so observing the Sabbath was a way to remember that. You are free. But second of all, to observe the, fa- the Sabbath took a measure of trust and faith in God's people to obey. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I could imagine that in an agrarian society, this was hard. Taking one day off a week was an enormous act of faith. Taking one year, a sabbatical year, off every seven years was also an enormous act of faith. You remember back then, the Mosaic Covenant promised agricultural prosperity for those who would obey. And so taking one day off a week was an enormous act of faith in that way. It was a test to see, am I trusting in God to be my provider here? Now, this is the one commandment out of the ten that isn't specifically reiterated and mentioned in the New Testament. And so for that reason, uh, there's some disagreement about how exactly to honor this commandment today. Whatever your view is on that, though, I think we can all agree that the principle of rest remains, that as God's people, we are to remember, to depend on God, to remember the importance of rest, to remember that He's our provider, and to remember the importance of setting aside time in our life for weekly worship. Remember the Sabbath. Commandment number five, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. This commandment is so important. It's the only commandment that actually has a reason attached with it. It actually has a promise attached to it right there inside of the commandment. It's important as if if you want to build a society where children honor their parents, that society is going to thrive in general because this is building into the next generation a sense of respect for authority. But if someone cannot even respect the authority of their parents... Well, they're going to have a hard time respecting authority outside of the home as well. Now, I realize some parents aren't perfect, but there are still some ways that we're called to always honor our father and our mother. But this is not just for little kids. This also has to do with caring for our parents even in their old age. Jesus addressed that in Mark chapter 7. Honor your father and your mother. Now, parenting is hard. We try to resource families here at NBC from time to time. You may have remembered, just by way of a short plug, we're having a parenting seminar this afternoon after this service about discipling the next generation. There's still time to come. It's going to be a supporting, equipping, building strong families kind of afternoon here, so we'd love to see you there across the parking lot in the YFMB. Honor your mother and your father. Commandment number six, you shall not murder. Now, you would think that this commandment probably needs the least explaining, But yet it is not understood by so many people in our day. Part of the reason for that is because the old King James here has a translation that can sometimes hinder understanding. It simply says, thou shalt not kill. But then you read the rest of the book of the covenant and you can see that certain crimes were actually punishable by death. And so it seems like a contradiction Almost, But the Hebrew word here is not just for killing, it is the word for murdering. It is not just the word for taking human life, it is specifically the word for wrongly taking innocent human life. And there's a big difference between killing and murdering. That's why I say to my wife, I killed the spider. I don't say, I murdered the spider. I think we all know there's a difference. If there's an accidental car wreck and someone tragically dies... We don't say that person was accidentally murdered. We say they were accidentally killed. And there is a distinction that's important for legal reasons. Now, you would think thou shalt not murder would be something we could all agree on that's a good idea. Unfortunately, you and I both know that's not the case, especially for those who are most vulnerable 
in our society, meaning children in the womb. There was recently a piece in the Washington Post written by Ruth Marcus championing the the abortion of children with Down syndrome. The article said that two-thirds of Americans would currently make that choice if they were in her shoes. This behavior is becoming more and more common, and she wrote in the article this, quote, This was not the child I wanted. You can call me selfish or worse, but I am in good company, unquote. Friends, she is wrong. She is not in good company. She is in quite evil company, and it takes a generation of lies to be able to make a statement like that. This behavior is displeasing to God. We are made in His image, and we are personally responsible not to wrongfully take the life of another innocent human being. Now, remember I said the first four commandments were about honoring God, and the next six commandments were about honoring other people? These six commandments are not just sins that I should personally avoid. Old Testament scholar Bruce Walke says, these are also the rights that I should seek to guarantee for you. In other words, I am to work for and I am to advocate for your right to life. I am to work for and advocate for your right to receive honor. I am to work for and to advocate for your right to to protected property and so forth. These are your rights and I must work to protect your rights as they are given by God himself. Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. This is a prohibition upon married people for not having intimate relations with anyone else besides their spouse. You'll recall Jesus elevated this to even lust in the heart. This commandment is so countercultural today, you cannot watch a romantic movie, hardly, without seeing not only adultery being committed, but adultery being celebrated as something wonderful in that film. But this commandment, along with the fourth commandment, is an establishment of marriage and the family as the most important building block in society. Marital unfaithfulness will threaten the cohesion of the family. Adultery can lead to a pregnancy, which of course could bring obligations outside of the family unit, but more importantly, living with an affair is living a lie and breaking down trust in a way that no other betrayal inside of marriage really can compare. And so what's necessary for marriages and families to thrive is trust. And by the way, this is tragic, as without the family, the larger social structure becomes under threat threat in society as well. In fact, breaking down the family unit is a great idea if you would like to set up an alternative kingdom in this world. This is the first culture, by the way, the Jewish culture, this is the first culture in human history where adultery was actually a sin for men, not just for women. Because what you'll see throughout these laws is that many of them were specifically designed to protect the most vulnerable in their society. You shall not commit adultery. As followers of God, Hebrews 13 says, keep the marriage bed pure. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. So this commandment means I cannot take anything that belongs to another person. That would include material property. It would also include immaterial property. That would include someone's intellectual property. That would include stealing from your employer by not working the hours that you've agreed to work or stealing from the government through tax evasion. But whether it's material or immaterial theft, taking the property that belongs to another person or entity is prohibited by God who said, you shall not steal. Now you might say, what's the big deal with some of these? The big deal is that you were made in the image of God. And we said earlier, you'll recall, the law reveals God's character. In other words, the reason why stealing is wrong is not just because you're taking somebody's stuff, although you are. It's because you were made in the image of God, and our God is not a thief, and when you steal, you don't reflect him the way that you were designed and created to reflect him. The reason why adultery is wrong is not just because you're breaking down trust in the marriage. You are. But it's wrong because our God is always faithful. 
and you're made in his image and you're made to reflect him. And when you do that, you're not reflecting him the way that you were created to reflect him. The reason why lying is wrong is not just because you're not going to be able to be trusted by other human beings. You're not. But the reason why it's wrong is because God is always truthful. You're made in his image. And when you lie, you do not reflect him the way that he has designed you to reflect him as you are made in his image. All of these laws are designed for you to reflect the image of God wherever you go all across the world. Commandment number nine. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, this commandment has to do with a commitment to complete honesty and truth-telling in a general sense. Think about just, okay, think about how many lies you're about to see this week. Think about how much fake news you're about to digest this week. Think about how many fact-checkers you're going to run across this week. Just think about how lying is pervasive all over your life all week. It, It has been said, quote, too many people today believe that actual virtue is less important than virtue signaling, unquote. Thou shalt not lie. This commandment would also prohibit sullying a person's dignity or good name or reputation through libel. The reason is because once a person's good name is stolen, it's very hard for them to restore it. And so this would also include perjury, bearing false witness in the court of law. And back then, by the way, if I was found guilty of perjury, I must pay the penalty that the person being accused would have paid. Think about that as a deterrent. But theologian Brevard Childs is right when he says, if this was just about truth-telling in the court of law, it would have added the words in court, which it doesn't, so it prohibits lying in general. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. We honor God through truth-telling. One more. Number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, the atheist Christopher Hitchens really had a problem with commandment number 10. Uh, Before he passed away, he wrote this in his book, God is Not Great. Quote, one may be forcibly restrained from wicked actions or barred from committing them, but to forbid people from contemplating them is too much, he said, unquote. But to covet, or this word here, means so much more than to contemplate. Or to want. It means to want something to the point of seeking to take it away uh, from the person to whom it belongs. But whatever belongs to another person, I must respect. If I do not do that, then all kinds of sin and evil will result from my coveting. The reason the attitude being addressed here in the 10th commandment is a problem is because this attitude often leads to some of the other sins. Think about it. It's coveting that leads to stealing. It's coveting that leads to adultery. It's coveting that becomes the root desire, the the sinful desire behind so many of our other sins mentioned here. And so we must learn instead to be content and to see the things that God has given as a gift to our brothers and sisters as good gifts, and we must never despise the good gifts that God has given to our brothers and sisters. So here's the Ten Commandments. Moses gets these commandments on literally tablets of stone written on the fingers of God. The two stone tablets were were probably not five commandments on one, five commandments on the other. Back then, when you would make a treaty, when you would make a covenant, when you would make it, it was called a suzerain vassal treaty, one copy would be for the giver of the covenant, one copy would be for the receiver of the covenant. There were two identical copies that were given when you made a treaty in this way. And so one was kept in the king's palace, and then one the servant would keep. In this case, you remember Moses keeps the Lord's copy in the tabernacle inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And so Moses gets these commandments, he gets these clay tablets, and after this, uh, there's a complicated section of Scripture, chapter 21, 22, and 23, where basically Moses takes the Ten Commandments and applies them to all of these different aspects and areas of life. It's case law. It's taking the Ten Commandments and saying, okay, how does it apply here in this relationship with this situation, this situation, this situation? And he explains all of that in chapter 21, 22, and 23. And then at the end of 24, he gets to the end, and they have a covenant ceremony together as a people and their God. And so Moses brings all the people together. He literally reads to them the book of the covenant. And then I'm just going to skip over to chapter 24 to look at the end as we see the people's response. Uh, They say in Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, these words, 
We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Now, this part of the book of Exodus, you could easily miss. This part of the book of Exodus is like that part of a marriage ceremony where the husband and the wife exchange vows. This is Moses, the minister, bringing Israel up to the altar and saying to them, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? And this is Israel saying, I do. The most dominant metaphor for the relationship between God and his people in the Bible is marriage. We see this in the book of Hosea, Ezekiel 16. We see this in Jeremiah. God's a jealous God. Just as a husband and wife is jealous to have an exclusive relationship with his people. And this is why when they violate the covenant later, he likens their violation to adultery. This is the marriage ceremony between God and his people. Exodus is a love story. God has courted his people. He has wooed his people. He has rescued his people. He has brought them through the desert and provided all of their needs. Now he has given them his perfect law, and here they are committing to keep it. It is beautiful, and there's only one problem. They don't, which leads us to the third movement, the problem with the law. The problem with the law is they don't keep the law and they can't keep the law, which leads us to that third purpose for the law I mentioned earlier. Yes, the law restrains evil. Yes, the law reveals God's character, but probably the primary purpose of the law is to convict you of sin. Amen. When we read the law, our hearts are laid bare. Our need is all of a sudden exposed. Romans 3.20 says, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And so the law, if it's doing its job properly, actually condemns us. That's why Romans says, by the works of the law, no man will be justified. I, I, I don't know about you, but I read these Ten Commandments. I've been studying these Ten Commandments all week, and I read these things, and I go, I am a mess. I haven't kept all these commandments. I'm not too sure I've kept any of these commandments perfectly. As the song says, I am a sinner, and if it's not one thing, it's another, caught up in words and tangled up in lies. I say with Isaiah the prophet, woe is me, I am undone. I say with that man from the Gospel of Luke, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can ascend his holy hill? Who has clean hands? Who has a pure heart? See, the law can command me to obey, but the law cannot bring about my obedience. The law points me to my biggest need. My biggest need is for a Savior. Amen. And the good news is, we got one. See, Paul says in the book of Galatians, the law was your tutor. The law was your nanny to take you somewhere, to train you somewhere, to lead you somewhere, to lead you to Christ. Amen. And so after Moses gives the commandment and after they say, I do, then Moses offers a sacrifice. Take a look with me at chapter 24, verse 8. It says, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. Does that phrase, this is the blood of the covenant, remind you of anything? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Everybody under the law fell short. Everybody under the Ten Commandments failed. Even the best of them failed. Even King David failed. That's because the law condemns the best of us, but grace saves the worst of us. See, in the gospel, in the person of Jesus Christ, he came born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, always did those things that pleased the Father, and then took on the curse of the Mosaic Sinai Covenant himself. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, and then by giving up his life in our place for our sins as our substitute, paying his 
precious blood as a gift for us, he then offers to us a new covenant through which we enter by faith alone. And we say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked I come to thee for dress, helpless I look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. The, The book of Hebrews describes something really amazing. Unlike the book of the covenant here, unlike the Mosaic covenant where the blood was sprinkled upon the people on the outside to be cleansed externally, Hebrews chapter 10 says, we've been sprinkled on the inside and our hearts have been cleansed and we've been cleansed from a guilty conscience. Jesus says, I want you to take this cup and I don't want you to sprinkle it all over yourself. I want you to take it in. I want you to drink it in. I want you to be clean on the inside. I came to replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh, a heart that pleases me, a heart that is not so offended by my law, a heart that loves me. I want you to be in relationship with me. As the hymn writer said, I hear the words of love. I gaze upon the blood. I see the mighty sacrifice, and I have peace with God. John Newton, before he passed away, was starting to lose his faculties. The guy who wrote Amazing Grace, and he said, I don't remember everything. I don't remember much. But one thing I do remember is that I am a great sinner, but Christ is a greater Savior. And then once we come to Christ in faith, we begin now to relate to God's law in a different way. We begin to live under the new covenant. You may remember that the law was given and remembered in the the history of Israel at the Feast of Pentecost. Penta, 50 days after Passover, that's when God gave the Mosaic law. This is what they remembered. But then 1,500 years later, after the original Pentecost, another Pentecost came. And the disciples were gathered together after the Lord Jesus had been ascended to his his father's right hand. And the disciples gathered at Pentecost in the upper room. And what did they experience there? They too experienced a violent shaking. Like the people at the original Pentecost, they too experienced a great wind. They too experienced a fire. But unlike Mount Sinai, They were not just confronted with God's power. They were indwelled by God's power. In the new covenant, God did not write the law on tablets of stone. He wrote the law on the tablet of the human heart itself. And so now having been cleansed from my sin and indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, God has given me a new heart, a heart that's tender and soft, Ezekiel 36 says, that's moldable and teachable. And now God takes the mess that I was, the brokenness that I was, the brokenness that we all are, and as broken as those tablets would be that Moses smashes in a minute, he takes all of the brokenness, puts it aside, and has a way to put it all back together and make something beautiful out of that which is broken. That's grace. That's mercy. That's really good news. And now after being recipients of such inexhaustible grace, I begin to look at the law in a different way now, not to learn of my condemnation anymore. I now look at the law because I want to know what pleases my Father's heart. And as Christians, I begin to love God and I begin to love even the moral law more and more each day. And I begin to live in faithful obedience to Him by the power of the Holy Spirit living in me. Puritan author Samuel Bolton says it so perfectly. He says, The law points us to Christ for our justification. Christ points us back to the law for our sanctification. The law points us to Christ for our justification, and then Christ points us back to the law for our sanctification. This is how I I grow. This is how I I grow spiritually. This This is where true freedom is found. I live my life how I was meant to live, in obedience to God's law. I no longer listen to the the lie of the enemy in the Garden of Eden that said, God's holding out on you with his law. No, he's not. The law is life on all cylinders. David said, I love your law. You've set my heart free. This is really living. And then the Apostle Peter takes the words of Exodus 19, and he applies them to you and me in the church age. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light or his marvelous light. Notice that phrase again, God's special possession. Exodus 19 says his treasured possession. Do you know what that means? That's a very technical term, very technical term. The special possession or the treasured possession referred to something that the king would own personally. Back then, the king would own everything. The king owned all the land. The king owned all the buildings. The king owned even the people. But the term special possession or treasured possession in Exodus 19 referred to the king's private wealth. This, this special term here re- referred to the wealth that he would store personally in his own palace, that which he personally delighted in that which he treasured in a special way. That's how God thinks of you. Let me try to illustrate this. Here's a picture of the Hope Diamond. This thing's 45 carats. It's so valuable. It's worth hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. It has been said it is so valuable that it's worthless because the only way to ever sell it is to cut it. It's priceless. You can't put a price tag on the Hope Diamond. That's the way God feels about you, his people. You are his special possession. You are his treasured possession. Friends, God loves you deeper than you could ever dare hope or imagine. That's God's heart. That's God's deepest desire. In the book of Exodus, God has already told his people who he is. Now, he's telling his people who they are. God made you his treasure. Now he invites you to make him his, your treasure. As the worship team comes, my encouragement, friends, is to consider how the law might apply to your life today. You have the best of all mediators in the person of Jesus Christ advocating for you. You have the power of the Holy Spirit working within you. Be faithful to the one who was faithful to you. Hold fast to him who holds fast to you. You have the most important work in all of the world. As God's chosen people to declare his excellencies, the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Can you imagine a church full of men and women that were committed to really understanding who they were as God's treasured possession? full of people who are willing to live their lives honoring God's law, who understand that God had made you his treasure and that you want to make him your treasure. Can you imagine a church full of people like that? Let's be that church. And Heavenly Father, how grateful we are. As we look at your law, we are first so aware of how we don't measure up. But then when we look at our Savior the one who kept the law perfectly on our behalf. Our hearts are filled with gratitude and joy. And so in a fresh way, would you teach us, your people, what it would look like to love your law. Teach us that your commandments are never to harm us, but for our good. Would you dispel the serpent's lie that says you're holding out on us? Help us to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, beholding his glory, and transform us, we pray, more and more and more into his very image, that we might walk in your ways in faithful obedience to you. We pray all this for Christ's sake and for his reputation. Amen.